Hey guys, welcome to Flow State Finance. My name's Arnav, and today I'm going to be talking about GAAP, or Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. I'll be discussing what they are and why they matter, as well as going over a few real-world examples to help improve your understanding. All right, so let's get started. But first, let's get one thing straight. Accounting is tricky, and oftentimes there are many things up for interpretation. Let's look at a couple of hypothetical questions and see how we might answer them. The first one is when should you record sales? This might seem straightforward, but it can have a lot more nuance than you might expect. Let's say you're ordering a computer from a tech retailer, like Best Buy. Let's say their financial quarter ends on December 1st, but you order a computer on November 30th, the day before, and it takes a week to get to you. When should the accountant log that sale? When the order is placed? When you get the order? Or somewhere in between? Or let's look at another hypothetical. Where should costs be allocated? Let's say you work as a manager in a factory. You are instrumental to your factory success. You make sure that all the products are being made on time, there are no hiccups in the assembly line, everything's going smoothly, and in a nutshell, you are an instrumental part of what makes those products come out as good as they do. So where should your salary go? Should it be factored in as a production cost because you are so important to the company's success and to the success of those individual products? Or should it be considered a labor cost because you are, after all, a laborer, you're a worker in that factory? Questions like these are what make accounting so tricky. And oftentimes it may seem like there's no solution. But that's where GAP comes in because GAP is the solution. GAP is a set of rules, standards, and procedures that companies use when preparing their financial statements. These rules are created and administered by the FASB, or the Financial Accounting Standards Board, and the AICPA, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. Basically, if you are a publicly traded company, you have to adhere to GAAP standards. So companies like Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Tesla must all do their accounting by these standards. Now, why does it matter? Why do we need these standards in the first place? GAAP adds some standardization into the field of financial reporting. Essentially, it puts all the thousands of publicly traded companies on the same financial page. Let's go through an example to see just how important this can be. Imagine if everyone in your class took a test and these were your friends' scores. You have Greg, John, and Melissa. Greg got 116, John got an 88, and Melissa got a 29. So who do you think did best? Well, some of you might say Greg, because he clearly has the highest number, but others may realize a problem here. It's entirely possible that these tests were not administered on the same scale. So how do you know how everyone did? Well, without any standardization, you would have to look at the scale associated with each person's exam in order to truly evaluate their score. So now, let's look at the same scores in the context of the total points possible. So Greg's 116 was out of 150 possible points. John's 88 was out of 100 possible points. And Melissa's 29 was out of 30 possible points. So now, let's standardize all these scores. And the way we'll do it is we'll use a percentage. Here are their scores as percentages. Greg got 116 out of 150, which is a 77%. John got an 88 out of 100, which is an 88%. And Melissa got a 29 out of 30, which is a 97%. So it turns out that Greg's 116 was actually the worst score, but you'd never know it just looking at it. So if I told you these scores by themselves, you would think that Greg did the best. But it turns out that Melissa did the best and Greg did the worst. So this is why it matters. If we didn't know the scale of each score, we would think Greg had the highest score. Turns out his score is actually the lowest. And that's what makes GAP so important. So you can see here, once again, Greg's score of 116 is the highest without any context, but as a percentage, which standardizes all of the scores, we can see that Melissa's score is actually the best. So now let's talk about the four main GAAP principles. The first is monetary units and historical costs. The second is conservatism. The third is consistency. And the fourth is full disclosure. Let's go over each of these in detail. The first is monetary units and historical cost. 
So monetary units means that everything in a financial statement has to be written in some sort of monetary unit. So dollars, euros, etc. So basically what this means is you can't say you sold 600 grams worth of gold worth of apples this year. This is just one of the ways in which GAAP standardizes everything. Because as you know, currency is in and of itself a form of standardization. Now let's talk about historical cost. Historical cost is the idea that the price a company paid for an asset is its value on the books. And by the books, obviously we mean a company's financials. So let's say in 1970, a company bought a warehouse in a major city for $100,000. On the books, it's worth $100,000. Now, I should mention that many companies don't follow this because it's illogical. It doesn't make sense to consider an asset in its historical value when it's appreciated since then, or even depreciated since then. That would just simply be illogical. So when often when valuing a company, accountants use present day value instead. Now let's talk about conservatism. Conservatism is the idea that accountants should be conservative with their estimates. Now this means two things. The first is that you must count a loss as soon as it can be quantified and confirmed. So any loss must be counted as soon as you know what the value of the loss was and you've confirmed that it was in fact a loss. The second thing is you have to make absolutely sure that a gain has occurred before you put it onto your financial statements. So now I'm sure you can imagine just what this conservatism implies. For losses, you must count them as soon as possible, as soon as they can be quantified and confirmed. And for gains, you have to make absolutely certain that it is a gain before you add it onto your books. Now let's go through an example because this may not be fully clear. Let's say you run a car dealership. How would you employ conservatism as a lead accountant for this company? So let's say there's a big storm and a tree falls on a car in your lot. You have to count it as a loss as soon as you can quantify the loss and confirm that it is a loss. So as soon as you know that the car is totaled and cannot be sold, you have to count it as a loss or a cost on your books. Now what this also means is hypothetically, let's say this tree fell on your car because somebody cut it down and so it was pushed onto your car and that totaled your car. So you file an insurance claim or you sue this person and let's say you get your money back. Let's say the car was a $50,000 car and you sue this person for $50,000 and you get your money back. On your books, it still has to count as a loss, irrespective of what money you may get from suing somebody or from the insurance company, whatever. As soon as you know that that loss is quantified and confirmed, you have to write it down as a loss. Later on, you can balance that out with a gain that you gained from the insurance company or from suing a person. But as it stands, as soon as you know that it's quantified and confirmed that this is a loss, you have to count it on your books as a loss. Now let's say something good happens. You've sold a car. You have to make absolutely sure that the gain has occurred before you put it on your financial statements. So you must be assured of these four things. One, somebody came in or called in expressing interest in that car. Two, they've taken the car with them, so you've delivered the product. Three, you know exactly how much the car was sold for. So often when you're selling cars, you negotiate on the price. So you need to know absolutely for sure how much you sold that car for. And four, you know that the person's gonna pay for the car that they purchased. You need to be sure of these four things. Somebody expressed interest in the car, you've delivered the product, you know the price that it was sold for, and you know that the person is going to deliver on the money that they promised you. Those are four things you have to be sure of before you can count that as a gain in your books. Next, let's talk about consistency. Consistency is basically the idea that the rules you follow now are the rules you should follow later. There's often a lot of flexibility in how companies structure their accounting. So what really matters is not exactly how you do it, because as I mentioned, GAAP is only a set of guidelines, but that it's done consistently. For example, if we look at the example of the factory manager's salary that we discussed earlier, if you decide to record their salary as production costs, let's say you decide, man, this guy is instrumental to the production of these products. He must be counted as a production cost. Make sure that you stick with it. If you record it as labor costs, make sure you stick with it. That's the importance of consistency. And the reason why they enforce consistency in GAAP standards is because they want to allow investors to be able to compare financials from one quarter to another or from one year to another. If you keep changing the way that you do your books, do your accounting every quarter, or let's say every two or three quarters or very frequently, then that becomes very difficult for the investors or potential stockholders or any anyone who's interest, interested in your company because they don't know 
just how well you're doing if you keep changing how you're you know calculating your successes so if you're consistent that eliminates that factor of stress from a lot of people uh, from a lot of people's considerations and that's what makes consistency so important is is to allow people to compare quarter to quarter or year to year and finally we have full disclosure so companies change all the time and with time companies might choose to make changes in their accounting process but when they do Full disclosure basically states that they have to disclose these changes as they're made. And the most important thing that you have to take away from this is the idea of material changes. A material change is a change that has a notable or material impact on a company's financials. You can think of it as a change that might influence an investor. Now, if there are any small changes that have been made by an individual accountant or an accounting department over the course of a quarter or a year or whatever the case may be that don't have a big impact on the end results of the financials, then they don't really have to disclose those because as I mentioned before, a lot of accounting is up for interpretation. So GAAP does allow for that flexibility um, within accounting departments and for individual accountants to make changes as they see fit. But if it's a material change, something that significantly influences an investor or could influence an investor, then they have to disclose that as part of their accounting process. So. Let's recap what we covered today. Number one, GAAP is a set of standardized guidelines for publicly traded companies that makes it easy for investors to compare financials. It has four main principles, monetary units and historical costs. Monetary units, again, is the idea that everything in a financial statement must be covered as monetary units, so dollars, euros, pounds, etc. And historical costs is the idea that the price you pay for an asset at the time of its purchase is what's gonna show up on its books. Now keep in mind that a lot of companies don't use historical costs when valuing companies because that's illogical. So it's more of a guideline that companies are more comfortable skimming around when doing their financial reports and when valuing companies for mergers, acquisitions, etc. The second principle is conservatism, and that consists of two things. One, you must count a loss as soon as it can be quantified and confirmed. So as soon as you know the value of the loss and you've confirmed that it is a loss, you must count it as a loss. And conversely, for gains, you must make absolutely sure that a gain has occurred before you account it in your books. Third, we have consistency, which means that companies should pick a way to do their accounting and stick with it for a fairly lengthy period of time to allow investors to compare quarterly financial reports, yearly financial reports. And it's basically designed to help investors, stockholders, and anyone interested in the company have a little more transparency into the company's financials. That's really why BAT exists. And then the fourth principle is sort of a continuation of that, and that's full disclosure. And that means basically when you are making any change, any sort of significant change, which is called a material change, uh, remember material change is a change that might influence an investor. When you are making a material change, you have to disclose it to your investors, stockholders, whatever the case may be, in your financial reports to add some more transparency into the company's financials and again, help individuals get a better understanding of your financials and be able to compare them more effectively from quarter to quarter or year to year. That's all for today. If you learned something new, be sure to share this video with your friends, like, and subscribe. Thank you for learning with Flow State Finance.